by our thoughts and Pythagoras are very narrow. In actual fact, we always think of him as a, as a mathematician. But in actual fact, and a man of numbers, the great man of numbers. But in actual fact, he instigated the Elysian mysteries. He reformed them because they were basically Minoan in extract. He got rid of the bestiality, he got rid of all the kind of sex and the orgies. He brought purification into it, self-discipline into it. The mysteries he brought into it, they had meditation, they had exercises rather like dervish turning, they had exercises that rather like the polyglide, that opened up parts of your brain. Now the polyglide, I can't do it, were you doing that and patting your head? Exercises like that. They had mild types of drugs to release parts of the brain, but they were masters of these drugs, but mainly prayer and meditation and mantras, all kinds of mysteries. And this great mathematician he was the person who reformed and purified Greece. But in his work, Pythagoras affects every aspect of our modern life. His great influence is especially surprising when one considers the fact that none of his written works have filtered down to us through the expanse of time. The fact that no primary sources survived limits our knowledge of him to the writings of others. Luckily enough, many great minds through the ages have studied the man, formed opinions of him, and written at length about him. So we do have some image as to what he was really like. But we are now confronted with a picture of a man who is part legend and part historical figure and whose life, in many respects, is utterly shrouded in mystery. What we do know is that Pythagoras grew up on the island of Samos in Ionia in the middle of the 6th century BC. Samos was a Greek colony at this time and ruled by the tyrant Polycrates. It flourished under the wealth and influence of the ever-growing Greek Empire. The Greek world in the 6th century BC was divided up into a lot of independent city-states. Some of them very small, little more than large villages. Some of them, even the largest, wouldn't be larger than about 100,000 population. That's about the size that Athens was in the 6th century. They were basically agricultural communities uh, almost the entire population would be engaged in farming most of the time. They would be run, whatever their political system was supposed to be, in reality by members of the elite, the richest people in society. And often there would be a lot of fairly violent competition between these members of the elite that might well lead to quite a lot of people going into exile because they were unhappy with who was running their state. Pythagoras was the son of a wealthy Samnian jeweller and had passed a trouble-free childhood learning as much about every facet of mathematics, science, and philosophy as he possibly could. We are told he was handsome and personable, and his intelligence and thirst for learning were impossible to quench. Each and every person who met Pythagoras recognized his potential. He was happy, inquisitive, and popular. Most boys would probably be educated by their parents, by their fathers. They wouldn't have very much that they needed to know. They would tend to know what was necessary for farming and for basic activities like that. It's unlikely that most people would ever learn to read. But for the rich, things were slightly different. Uh, they would be people who had a future as political leaders. They would expect to be able to speak in public and to engage in social activities with other rich people. The kind of things that they would learn to do would be to read and write, to speak in public, to play musical instruments, and probably to sing and even to compose songs on the spot. Pythagoras took a particular interest in advanced mathematics, religion, 
and every school of philosophic thought. His great mind soon saw that if he took the truest parts of each of the doctrines, however diverse, and combined them together, he could create the ultimate philosophy. Through these disciplines, he was laying the foundations of what would become known as Pythagoreanism. There are two very different things. One is Pythagoras and what he taught and what he believed and what he knew. And the other is what's called Pythagoreanism, which is things in the spirit of Pythagoras, which is a much broader tradition. Pythagoras was around in the 6th century BC. Uh, Pythagoreanism was around for several hundred years and longer. It's a tradition of a way of thinking. But Pythagoras still had a great deal of searching to do. Like many today, Pythagoras tried a variety of religions in search of spiritual peace. Out of all of the many religions that he embraced, Pythagoras found himself most attached to the Orphic religion and adopted it as a way of life. Even in those distant days, the Orphic religion was an old one and had to an extent fallen into decline. Ultimately, he hoped to bring the religion back to life. He hoped it would inspire the same interest in the temples as there had been at the time of Orpheus, whose temples now lay neglected and ruined. Central to the religion of Orpheus was the belief in the immortality of the soul and the notion of reincarnation. Many other religions have had or still do have similar beliefs. Pythagoras believed that poetry and music would purify the immortal soul which had been imprisoned as a punishment for sin in the mortal body. By becoming a philosopher and searching for the truth, he felt that his soul would become closer to the gods and further and further removed from the lawless desires of the flesh. And if at length, leaving behind thy body, thou dost come to the free upper air, then shalt thou be deathless, divine, a mortal man no more. It was Plato who identified the simple day-to-day -day advantage of a belief in reincarnation. He resolved that we shall be unafraid of death if, at the time of death, it is perceived that the soul merely transfers to another body. This philosophy was to serve Pythagoras well throughout his life. By its simple logic, he did not fear death, which was just as well as he was to have numerous brushes with the Grim Reaper over the years. A follower has noted, So, only a man with cowardly natures can't really have any dealings with true philosophy, and a well-balanced man, who is neither mean nor ungenerous, nor boastful nor cowardly, can hardly be difficult to deal with, or unjust. Sadly, for a man of Pythagoras's talent, there was no equivalent of further education in Greece at this time. The schools of philosophy, which would be set up by Plato and Aristotle in the 4th century BC, still lay in the future. Not surprisingly, Pythagoras soon became tired of the constraints of the limited discussions about politics, philosophy, and mathematics that took place in the Agora. His insatiable appetite for knowledge drove him to seek out new sources. To the east of the Greek world, you've got a number of larger empires, Lydia, Persia, Babylon, and Egypt. And there would be quite a lot of contact between these. You get cultural ideas flowing in both directions, but in particular, a number of states in the eastern part of the Greek world would tend to pick up a lot of ideas from these ancient empires. And at the same time, you'd expect a fair amount of trade. Samos, in particular, seemed to have a lot of trade with Egypt in this period, and that led to quite a lot of wealth and quite a lot of interesting Egyptian goods being found in Samos. Although the tuition that he had received from Anaximander and the great Thales provided him with a sound approach to learning, 
There were many questions he still wanted answering. The lack of opportunities for further education in Samos forced Pythagoras to travel. In order to gain more information, at first he traveled to other parts of Greece, then he moved on to Asia Minor and finally settled in Egypt, where he was to remain for many years. Egypt was then one of the great world powers, a seat of great knowledge and learning. It was still under the exotic reign of the pharaohs, and Pythagoras plunged into the task of piecing together the myriad of new philosophies he acquired, and studying with the priests at the ancient and cosmopolitan city of Memphis. When Pythagoras went to Egypt, of course, Egypt wasn't what it had been. The great days of the pharaohs were past. And the rest of the Mediterranean world was in upheaval. There were other great civilizations. So what Pythagoras saw was in fact the end of an empire, but the Hellenistic world, which of course was after Pythagoras, introduced by Alexander the Great, was beginning to be felt. There was this interest in learning. You have people studying geometry and various theories and astronomy. So Pythagoras, with his ideas of mathematics, was very welcome in a society which was very much an inquiring society. Mathematics and philosophy had been his life, and it is not difficult to imagine his delight on first sight of the inherent geometry of the pyramids. Wise men who claimed to have the answers to life and the universe were known in Pythagoras' day as sages. Pythagoras emphatically disliked the idea that the title sage implied superiority. To him, it seemed immodest and undeserved. Enriched by his studies, he felt that there was no black art to knowledge and truth. He sought a word to explain his feelings, which has survived to this day. The new word came from two Greek words, philos, lover, and sophia, wisdom or truth. A philosopher then, a lover of wisdom and truth. Through the work of Pythagoras, slowly it was to dawn on the ordinary man that this did not necessarily need to be the province of the educated. He too could seek the truth and acquire wisdom he could have the same understanding of life as a sage. By his work, Pythagoras sought to banish elitism. During his time in Egypt, Pythagoras was contentedly absorbed in his studies of nature, philosophy, and maths, and began to educate others with his new knowledge. This was a crucial time in Pythagoras's development, and the tranquility and luxury of the kingdom of the pharaohs was a fertile ground for the development of his philosophy. Unfortunately, Egypt was about to go through a transformation that would see her decline from world leader to third world power. War and invasion meant the reign of the formidable pharaohs was over. The peaceful existence of Pythagoras was about to be shattered. So much so, in 525 BC, Cambyses II, the Persian king, invaded Egypt. And this was a terrible thing to happen. And the Persians ruled Egypt down to 359 BC, when for the last flourishing, you might say, of the Egyptian pharaohs came about. For Pythagoras, this was the beginning of a violent 
and changeable period of his life. He and the world around him became more dangerous. Along with many of the great thinkers, he was taken from Egypt to Babylon as a prisoner. He remained for some time in prison, but even here his talents shone through and he was pressed into service to educate the Babylonian people with his discoveries. Always he remained positive, convinced by the power of God. Of ills the goddess fortune gives to man, bear meekly thou thy lot, nor grieve at it, but cure it as thou canst. Remember this, fate gives the least of all evil to the good. We are told that Pythagoras never got angry. It went against his very nature. But he longed for the stability and happiness that he had been surrounded by in Egypt for so long. He was struck with a desire to create a community where people could live an honest and peaceful existence. He believed he could force a change to a more tranquil and more fulfilling life through teaching his way of life to others. He was desperate to realize his ideals. And when eventually Pythagoras was to be given freedom from Babylon and he returned to Samos, he was full of enthusiasm for his ideas and eager to find a site for his community. He was faced once again with disappointment and despair. The beautiful, affluent land that he remembered so fondly from his youth had been devastated by corruption, oppression, and neglect. Pythagoras could see quite clearly that Samos was not the place for him to collect his followers together and spread truth. The truth was too disheartening. In 530 BC, as he approached his late fifties, Pythagoras abandoned Samos in disgust. He was never again to return to his homeland. He journeyed to Croton on the Italian mainland to escape the oppressive rule. It was in Croton where Pythagoras was to spend the rest of his life trying to educate all those he came across in the doctrine of mathematics, philosophy, and nature. Croton was a Greek colony, and it was currently unaffected by war. Pythagoras then began the mammoth task of striving to enlighten and teach the people of Croton his way of life, and in doing so, helping them to find a better existence. As one of his followers was to note, But courage! Men are children of the gods! And slowly, he began to attract more and more people, men and women alike, who shared his outlook and desire for a permanent change from war and struggle to stability and community. Pythagoras met, fell in love with, and married a native of Croton. He became a father, but it's unclear how many children he had. And in Croton, Pythagoras formed a brotherhood which was to become the mother of all schools of idealism. He developed ideas which he considered to be important for education, combining science with philosophy and art. He taught a complete way of life. The extreme view would suggest that they were very much isolated groups who were strict vegetarians and who probably refused to eat some other things. There are stories about Pythagoras refusing to eat beans. Uh, this is usually connected with a belief that does seem to be a strong part of Pythagoreanism, of the uh, reincarnation of souls. This, on the whole, is unlikely to be entirely true, and even in the ancient world, there were those who criticized the idea that the Pythagoreans were strictly vegetarian. His brotherhood became increasingly successful. The Brotherhood lived by way of a common law of property, share and share alike. They owned nothing and everything. It isn't difficult to see the clear similarities 
between this and the general idea behind communism, Marxism, the hippie commune, the kibbutz, and others too numerous to mention. Pythagoras was the pioneer, but it was Plato who later seized upon this idea and developed it with great enthusiasm. Over a century later, following his travels to Sicily and southern Italy, Plato took great trouble to obtain a copy of the work of Pythagoras. It was vitally important that he had these works in order to study the ideas of Pythagoras in depth. He had been inspired by a small group of people he had met in Italy who tried to live by the old laws of the Pythagoreans. Plato called them the wise men in Italy. Having read the works of Pythagoras, Plato proclaimed that Pythagoras was as essential to philosophy as the legendary Prometheus was to mankind when he gave them the gift of fire. The way of life that the Pythagoreans lived and taught is an obvious influence on Plato's Republic, the work for which he is best remembered. In the Republic, each man creates an ordered society based around equality, education, and harmony. Inspired by Pythagoras, Plato was totally enthralled by the idea of applying mathematical theories to ethics and social planning to create an ideal community seen so clearly in his Republic. But the ideas of Pythagoras were not without their opponents. Aristophanes, a Greek playwright in the 5th century BC, parodies the idea of having a common law community in his play, The Assembly Women. He uses his leading lady, Praxagora, as the mouthpiece to explain the Pythagorean philosophy. What I'm going to say is that everyone is to have an equal share in everything and live on that. We won't have one man rich while another lives in penury. One man farming hundreds of acres of land while another hasn't enough to get buried in. One man with dozens of slaves and another with none at all. There will be one common stock of necessities for everybody and these will be shared equally. First of all, I will declare all land, all money, and all private possessions to be common property. From the time of Pythagoras onwards, this sentiment has been at the core of many ideals. Throughout the ages, thinkers and politicians from Marx to Mao have sought after and tried without success to find a solution to poverty and inequality. Pythagoras, too, wrestled with the problem of how to achieve equality without trying. In a less free world, he seems to have come closer than Stalin or Castro ever got. Pythagoras was accepted at Croton with ease. His political status in the town was rising, but this was to prove the last truly stable period of his life. Pythagoras concentrated the wisdom and energy that he had gathered during the time he had spent traveling and created the theories that would be referred to and used for over 2,000 years after his death. Not something that he could have easily visualized. Everyone knew that the world was flat. It was obviously insane to assume otherwise. The scientific conclusion was that there was a ball of fire in the center of the earth on the opposite side from the one that humans inhabited. Therefore, it had never been seen. But Pythagoras discovered that the earth orbits the sun rather than the other way around, and the moon orbits the earth. He began to edge his way towards the view that the earth was in fact spherical. He was searching for an explanation as to why the days changed in length and the seasons came and went. But he never reached the final truth. We don't have any of Pythagoras' original writings. Therefore, one has to trust to other sources to try and see what he knew and what his followers believed 
uh, and there are many fanciful stories, but clearly two of the main sources are those who have left us the most uh, books from around that period, which are Plato and Aristotle. It was in fact Plato who took the findings of Pythagoras and developed the idea of the spherical Earth's tilting on an axis, which explained the changes to days and seasons. But he did so on the back of the word of Pythagoras. The planets were a source of continual wonderment to Pythagoras. One theory developed by him was that each of the five known planets that were known to orbit the sun gave off a note as it journeyed on its course. The pitch of the note depended on the distance of each individual planet from the sun and the speed with which it traveled in its path. It was caused by its passage through the upper air or the ether. He called it the harmony of the spheres and he must have mused long on the beauty of that heavenly music which the earthbound were destined never to hear. Pythagoras arrived at this theory from a parallel he made when playing a lyre. He noticed that the varying lengths of the different strings on the instrument gave different notes. The principle was a simple parallel. The lengths of the string were relative to one another, and therefore music could be reduced to a mathematical equation or ratio. Mathematics could be applied to the cosmos and to music, so the Pythagoreans took their theories to the point where they said that things are numbers. From this, the theory of opposites was crafted, on which Plato based his theory of the forms. Relationships, I think, in, in Greek philosophy and science are very complicated. I, I wouldn't have thought it was the Pythagorean theory of opposites. It's more other Ionian philosophers who used the very simple-minded idea of there being opposites, hot and cold, heavy and light. Uh, in mathematics, more odd and even, flat and curved, or straight and curved. And in some areas, this worked very well to allow analysis of uh, serious bits of science, or mathematics, or philosophy. Once you get more into the human side, I think you lose the precision that you get in mathematics. Whether a number is odd or even is well defined. Similarly, in a sense, whether somebody is a man or a woman is well defined, but it doesn't necessarily tell you everything about them. And a lot of this gets fanciful in a way that we would tend to smile at. But if you look more deeply, the whole approach is not so different from the amazing mysticism which lies behind modern science. I think the Greek idea is that you should not judge something by what it appears to be. If you look at things, they seem terribly complicated. Yet they had a very fundamental belief that underneath things were really quite simple. And the idea was that you should study not what a thing looks like, but what its ideal form is. Uh, it's not always easy to understand what they meant, but for example, there are four elements that whatever, however complicated the world looks, it's all made up of four elements, earth, air, fire and water. And this is not unrelated to the, the theoretical assumption of the opposites, where you simplify the complex world into hot and cold, male and female, and so on, and try and analyze it in that way. The same spirit continues, I think, in the theory of forms. The mathematical studies of Pythagoras have left one outstanding relic, a simple truth which everyone has come across and is directly attributed to him. Pythagoras's theorem. To this day, the square of the hypotenuse in a right angle triangle is always equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Here was natural philosophy in its truest form.
Enthralled by his great discovery, Pythagoras wanted to take his theories further. He studied what can only be described as the first form of pure geometry. If you think about what Pythagoras' theorem says, that if you have a right angle triangle, then the squares of these two sides, if you add them, you will get equal to the square of the hypotenuse, the longer side. If you think about lengths, you add lengths, and if you're doing carpentry or something else, you might subtract them to get an exact measure, but you would never square a length. Why would you square a length? If you wanted to understand a triangle, why would you square lengths and add them? It's the most peculiar thing to do, and nobody would ever do it unless they had some deeper insight into what was going on, and it is just as important today as it was then. The whole point of Pythagoras is if you actually want to know the length of the hypotenuse, for all practical purposes, you could measure a scale diagram, just draw these lengths and get a ruler and measure the hypotenuse. And that would give you accuracy uh, as much as you need. But the point is that in mathematics, Pythagoras' theorem allows you to calculate the exact length, God's length for the hypotenuse. And it's this understanding that somehow one needs results which give you, allow you to calculate exactly, rather than more the artisan's approach of, of measuring and making models and feeling that a ruler is sufficient. Mathematics is about exact things, and the Greeks understood this. And it's just as true today as it was then. So this is a classic example of a piece of mathematics that doesn't get old. In no sense does it get old. It's as true and as marvelous and as wonderful and as unexpected today as it was then. Having developed the theory of the harmony of spheres, he was able to combine this with the advanced maths and arrive at the conclusion that the cosmos is a mathematically ordered whole. The key to the universe is the science of numbers. Today, how many of us using computers in countless millions could really disagree with him? Again, Pythagoras' influence was phenomenal. Galileo, the Renaissance mathematician and physicist, was taken with this idea, and with this as a base, he developed his theory. The Book of Nature is written in mathematical symbols. This from a man who lived thousands of years before man could split the atom. Pythagoras had always known that in the future, a language would be invented, which was purely mathematical symbols. Galileo's work was the basis for parts of modern-day physics. Unfortunately, it would not always prove the best for mankind. This amazing belief that you can understand complicated things through number and shape began to permeate through the Renaissance mentality. And certainly around 1600, you find a whole load of things happen together. You find Galileo using his telescopes to look at the heavens to find that they're not the way everybody had expected. Galileo also doing experiments with, with balls rolling down inclined planes, sadly probably not dropping balls from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, as everybody says, but beginning to try to use mathematics, to use geometry, Greek geometry, to understand what's going on. Even though Plato had wholeheartedly taken on board the teachings of Pythagoras, it is dangerous to assume that he naturally learned them from his close friend and teacher, Socrates. Socrates was fully aware of all the ideas and philosophies of Pythagoras and other pre-Socratic philosophers, yet he rebelled against them. He claimed that they were more concerned with cosmology than their fellow men and the way in which they ought to conduct their lives. Socrates rejected all the theories of Pythagoras apart from the theory concerning the immortality of the soul. Plato relates the words of Socrates. Well then, our recent argument and the others prove conclusively that the soul is immortal. Yet it is to the student of Plato that we must turn if we are going to find the most comprehensive and accurate witness to the greatness of Pythagoras, Aristotle the greatest of all philosophers, sought to reproduce and explain more clearly the philosophies of Pythagoras and his followers. He had Plato's copy of Pythagoras's works to work from, and he set about his task with relish. 
unable to steer clear of bias, his accounts are somewhat unreliable. We have to allow for artistic license. Aristotle clearly provides uh, an insight into some aspects of Pythagoreanism, but I think perhaps not in the most fruitful fashion. Certainly the theory of opposites, the odd and the even, which was certainly a Pythagorean analysis for number, which is, is very effective. But I think in many ways Plato represents a, a much better representation, certainly of the more mathematical and scientific aspects uh, of Pythagoras, as, as far as one can tell what it was that, that he and his followers believed in maths and philosophy. Socrates, Plato and Aristotle all borrowed parts of Pythagoras's work to enhance and develop their own. But the most important aspect regarding these unique classical philosophers is that they all acknowledged Pythagoras as a vital scholar and pioneer in a field of man's philosophic and scientific endeavor. As surely as day follows night, the search for peace is doomed to failure. Pythagoreanism was ultimately to end in chaos. The Sybarites, the people of the town of Sybaris, were beginning to feel threatened by the popularity and power that Pythagoras had gained in the 20 years that he had been in Croton. Croton and Sybaris were two neighboring towns in southern Italy, and it was a feature of Greek civilization that neighboring towns were almost always fighting each other. And this is perhaps even more true in southern Italy than it was in mainland Greece. We don't know really very much about why these particular towns uh, ended up in conflict. Uh, history seemed to suggest that there were exiles from Sybaris who found their way to Croton and demands were made by the ruler of Sybaris for their return and this led to war. What had previously been a strong and contented community in Croton was suddenly hit by an invasion in 510 BC by the Sybarites. Pythagoras must have been driven to despair. For 20 years, he had been desperately hoping that he would be able to guard his people against the same terrible fate that befell the land of the pharaohs. Now, yet again, his worst fears were being realized. The specter of war and conquest had caught up with him again. Ultimately, he and his dreams were to be destroyed. But how? From this point onwards, history is unclear. As befits a man with such mystic history, his death remains an enigma. There are two main theories. Some scholars favor the idea that due to his distraught frame of mind, he followed the pattern of his former years, and when the trouble arose, he fled to Metapontium to start his teachings all over again. If this is so, then there is no record to recall how or when he died. An equally possible suggestion is the claim that Pythagoras stayed in Croton after the war to try and rebuild his stability. He was an old man by this stage, and to build around the foundations that he had at Croton would have been easier than to start again in another town. If this is true, it would substantiate the legend which has come down to us. After the war with Sybaris, a man named Cylon started an opposition to the legendary Pythagoras, claiming that the Pythagorean order was against liberty and choice. How often would that claim echo through the centuries against each fresh attempt to establish communism? This minor conflict went on until 504 BC when a group of about 40 Pythagoreans, Pythagoras among them, held a meeting at the house of Milo. A few followers of Cylon burned the house to the ground, burning all but a few of the Pythagoreans to death.
One school of thought suggests Pythagoras fled from the fire in a panic and escaped, only to be captured by those responsible for the fire and put to death by their hand. Thou shalt know, self-chosen are the woes that fall on men, how wretched, for they see not good so near, nor hearken to its voice. Few only know the pathway of deliverance from ill. After the war between Croton and Sybaris, there seems to have been an expulsion of the Pythagoreans from a number of the cities that they were active in in southern Italy. And the story seems to be that this was largely due to a democratic rebellion against the Pythagorean ideas. Pythagoras had brought prosperity to these cities with his ideas, but these, the concentration on purity, on health, on other things, seems to have restricted ideas of liberty and freedom. And we seem to have an idea that there's a clear conflict between the austere, healthy life that uh, Pythagoras was advocating and the normal, democratic, free life that the majority of the citizens seem to have wanted. Pythagoreanism lasted for about half a century after the death of Pythagoras, but at no point since has it ever again enjoyed such strength and vitality. Pythagoras, it seems, was Pythagoreanism. Even though he is a virtually forgotten hero in today's society, Pythagoras contributed to each and every one of our lives. Most of us are barely conscious of the importance of the theorem we are religiously taught in school. I think Pythagoras' theorem is, in many ways, a wonderful representative of, of Greek knowledge and, and learning, which links directly into what we would do today. It's part of the human psyche that everybody wants to be remembered for something or other. I suppose we all try to achieve immortality. But fancy being remembered by every schoolboy, not with hatred, but at least in an uncomfortable fashion as Pythagoras is for geometry, for the fact that in a right angled triangle, the square on the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides. And we've all suffered in our geometry lessons under that. What a legacy from a man who is a mathematician, a philosopher, one who was respected in the ancient world and merely remembered for one theorem. Pythagoras was the original philosopher and is rightly seen as the father of the greatest of the ancient thinkers. He was man, myth, and mathematician. Pythagoras are very narrow. In actual fact, people always think of him as a, as a mathematician. But in actual fact, and a man of numbers, the great man of numbers. But in actual fact, he instigated the Elysian Mysteries. He reformed them because they were basically Minoan in extract. He got rid of the bestiality, he got rid of all the kind of sex and the orgies. He brought purification into it, self-discipline 
into it. The mysteries he brought into it, they had meditation, they had exercises rather like dervish turning, they had exercises that rather like the polyglide, that opened up parts of your brain. Another you know the polyglide, I can't do it, were you doing that and patting your head? Exercises like that. They had mild types of drugs to release parts of the brain, but they were masters of these drugs, but mainly prayer and meditation and mantras, all kinds of mysteries. And this great mathematician, But we are now confronted with a picture of a man who is part legend and part historical figure and whose life, in many respects, is utterly shrouded in mystery. What we do know is that Pythagoras grew up on the island of Samos in Ionia in the middle of the 6th century BC. Samos was a Greek colony at this time and ruled by the tyrant Polycrates. It flourished under the wealth and influence of the ever-growing Greek Empire. The Greek world in the 6th century BC was divided up into a lot of independent city-states. He was the person who reformed and purified Greece. But in his work, Pythagoras affects every aspect of our modern lives. His great influence is especially surprising when one considers the fact that none of his written works have filtered down to us through the expanse of time. The fact that no primary sources survived limits our knowledge of him to the writings of others. Luckily enough, many great minds through the ages have studied the man formed opinions of him and written at length about him. So we do have some image as to what he was really like. Some of them very small, little more than large villages. Some of them, even the largest, wouldn't be larger than about 100,000 population. That's about the size that Athens was in the 6th century. They were basically agricultural communities uh, almost the entire population would be engaged in farming most of the time. They would be run, whatever their political system was supposed to be, in reality by members of the elite, the richest people in society. And often there would be a lot of fairly violent competition between these members of the elite that might well lead to quite a lot of people going into exile because they were unhappy with who was running their state. Pythagoras was the son of a wealthy Samnian jeweller and had passed a trouble-free childhood learning as much about every facet of mathematics, science, and philosophy as he possibly could. We are told he was handsome and personable, and his intelligence and thirst for learning were impossible to quench. Each and every person who met Pythagoras recognized his potential. He was happy, inquisitive, and popular. Most boys would probably be educated by their parents, by their fathers. They wouldn't have very much that they needed to know. They would tend to know what was necessary for farming and for basic activities like that. It's unlikely that most people would ever learn to read. But for the rich, things were slightly different. Uh, they would be people who had a future as political leaders. They would expect to be able to speak in public and to engage in social activities with other rich people. The kind of things that they would learn to do would be to read and write, to speak in public, to play musical instruments, and probably to sing and even to compose songs on the spot. 